on Sunday, I went to the shops and uh, and I saw the, the front pages of the newspapers in, in this country and it's completely amazing. You you think, I mean, uh, I don't know. Uh, the, the amount of propaganda, there's, uh, there's crying babies on the front pages, uh, brave soldiers defending a uh, bridge and uh, Liz Truss wants to, foreign secretary, wants to, wants to recreate the international brigades and uh, she's not going to go and fight, uh, mind you. And there's not going to be any British soldiers actually involved in this, uh, in this fighting. There is a huge amount of uh, propaganda and uh, the, the imperial, I mean, there's some really amazing things. Yesterday I saw Condoleezza Rice. Who was, the, who was the person responsible, or, or one of the, the, the main people behind the invasion of Iraq in 2003, she said, if you invade a country, a uh, sovereign country with no reason, that's a war crime. And, uh, and she was responsible for invading uh, Iraq. Then, um, what's his name, a Swedish uh, guy, Jan Stoltenberg. I think he's Norwegian. Okay, well, uh, not, not Swedish, uh, not Swedish, Scandinavian uh, general secretary of NATO was saying, was saying, this is a scandal, it's a violation of international law, and, uh, and the sovereignty of Ukraine has been violated, uh, and, and other people like that, I saw Solana, who used to be the general secretary of NATO at the time of the bombing of Yugoslavia, and he said, this is the closest that Europe's come to war since uh, 1945. And what about what about the bombing of Yugoslavia that uh, NATO carried out in 1999? And uh, I'll tell you another thing. Uh, we'll go into this a bit uh, more later. But uh, some some uh, bourgeois commentators are saying, "Oh, uh, Russia has failed in this uh, operation." By the way, we we oppose this invasion for reasons that I will explain in a, in a minute. But these reasons have nothing to do with the reasons why uh, the, 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 the bourgeois commentators and leaders are on the media uh, raising a hue and cry about this question. International, international law, I mean, the NATO and the United States, Britain, France, all these countries have carried out imperialist uh, wars of aggression, bombing countries, changing countries' governments, without no respect for international law, which is a farce anyway, no respect for the sovereignty of any country. Uh, they, they say, oh, the inv inviolability of uh, borders in Europe, which is, goes back to, I don't know, the, the Treaty of Westphal. What, they just uh, split uh, Yugoslavia uh, in a completely reactionary war in which uh, Germany had a big uh, hand pushing for, for the reactionary split of Yugoslavia in 1992, which led to a whole series of reactionary wars, ethnic cleansing, and so on, and uh, an aerial bombardment of, uh, of a number of uh, peoples. They're completely hypocritical. They, they have no right, no moral standing to say anything. But obviously they will. They will now. Uh, and why? Because this uh, imperialist war is not being carried out by them, but by another imperialist country that they're not, not so keen anymore. Mm -hmm. But if you actually look at it, when, when uh, Putin gave his justifications for the war, because any war, always is carried out under some pretense. It's never carried out for markets, control of natural resources, spheres of influence, which are the real reasons for imperialist wars. They always carry it out for humanitarian reasons, for the protection of uh, some other people. And, uh, and he said, I'm, uh, I'm, he's, he's, not invading, uh, he's not invading Ukraine. You see, this is, a, this is a, what, what do you call it? A military technical operation or something like that for the protection of the Russian-speaking people in the Donbass, uh, which have been, have been subject to genocide by the Kiev, and for the denazification of uh, Ukraine. We'll go into this in, in a minute. But you see, this is exactly, exactly the same line of argument that NATO used to bomb Serbia. Serbia is carrying out a massacre of the Kosovo Albanians, and has massacred the Bosnian uh, Muslims in Srebrenica, and so on. Exactly the same justifications, but in both cases, they are lies. They are lies. And, and that's why I said at the beginning, we need to, we need to be able to cut through the, the fog of lies and, and, uh, and propaganda. Next. This is the hypocrisy of the West. But what are the reasons why Putin went into this uh, war? Well, um, if you've been following this uh, developing crisis, you could see about two months ago or so, Putin said, 
sent a letter in writing to uh, NATO and the West, and he said what he wanted. And what he wanted was a guarantee that uh, Ukraine and Georgia will not uh, join NATO, a guarantee, uh, common guarantees for security in Europe, which will involve no deployment of troops to the border of uh, Russia, no military exercises in the border of Russia, and the uh, U.S. going back to the treaty that they left in 2000, I can't remember when, 2015, 2019, the treaty for the non-proliferation of medium range ballistic missiles in Europe, i.e. missiles that are installed in Europe and can hit uh, Russia. There was a treaty that the, the, this will, will not take place, but then the United States left this treaty. And from, from this, you can see what he really wants. And what he really wants is, is, a, is the bigger picture that we need to uh, look into. He's, he doesn't care about the Russian people in the Donbass, uh, uh, about which I will speak uh, uh, later. Uh, he's just using them a small change in the negotiations that he expects to have with, with uh, whatever government remains in, in Kiev at the end of this. Um, the real truth behind this that you can, you can see from his actual demands is that Russia is an imperialist country. But, but it's not a big imperialist country. It's a, say, small or medium-sized imperialist uh, country. It's an imperialist country that's been constantly encircled and, and surrounded by NATO uh, threatening uh, countries. Now, now they say NATO is a, it's a defensive alliance. It's not, a threat to, uh, it's not a threat to anyone. But obviously the Russians see, see it in a different, uh, in a different uh, light. And the history of NATO gives you, gives you an indication of what kind, what kind of, uh, of an alliance NATO is. But anyway, this is, this is a fact. When, when the Soviet Union collapsed, when Stalinism collapsed in 1998, uh, 1989, 91, the, the dissolution of the Soviet Union in, in 91, uh, the leaders of Russia were given guarantees, written guarantees, that there will be no expansion of NATO eastwards. And since 1997, a whole host of countries have joined uh, NATO in the Balkans, in Eastern Europe, and, uh, and so on, right up to the border of Russia, uh, the Baltic uh, countries. And uh, at that time, Russia had been, as a country, as an economy, had been completely decimated by the restoration of capitalism. The restoration of capitalism meant the wholesale looting of state property by a bunch of bureaucrats and foreign multinationals at the behest of the IMF, the IMF recommended the shock uh, therapy, as they uh, called it, a massive disaster for the living standards for the population of Russia. I don't know if you've seen the graph, the, the even, even life expectancy collapsed in those uh, years, unprecedented. I think the collapse of the GDP was 40%. At that point, Russia, Russian capitalism, was in no position to oppose NATO and NATO's eastward uh, advance. We couldn't do anything about it, but now is a different matter. For a number of years now, Russia has been flexing its muscles. Uh, it, it benefited from a boom in oil uh, prices and prices of gas that went up very much uh, in, the, in, the in the 2010s and uh, built a stronger economy. It's not, it's not uh, I mean, the, the Russian economy cannot be compared with the, with the US economy, for instance, or the economy of China, or the economy of, of major powers in Europe is, is further down. Uh, particularly if you take into account it has a big uh, population, massive territory, and so on. However, uh, Russia is not, is not a poor, dominated uh, country that uh, wants to allow itself to be, to be pushed about by the big powers. On the contrary, Russia wants to uh, at least reassert its power, and this is an imperialist behavior, reassert its power in, its, in the region, in its what they call the, 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 the near, near abroad, i.e. Uh, Central Asia, the Caucasus, uh, Eastern Europe, the Balkans, uh, partly in, uh, in the Middle East. And they've been doing so for a number of uh, years. 2000 and, thank you. 2008, they invaded uh, Georgia, again, under the excuse of protecting the people in uh, Ossetia and, and uh, South Ossetia and, and Abkhazia, which then declared the independent republics. They went in. This was a country that was wanting to join NATO. And it's in, it's, the, on, it's, in, it's in the underbelly of uh, Russia, a strategic uh, area for the export of gas and, and so on. And they said, no, we're having none of this. We, they warned them. They didn't uh, listen. And they went in. The, this country's, uh, Georgia's uh, military had been trained and, 
and kitted, uh, equipped by, by NATO. They went in, they destroyed the army, and they came out. And they made sure there's not going to be a government in, uh, in uh, Georgia that challenges the power of Russia. This is, imp this is what imperialism is. Uh, it's on a smaller scale than U.S. imperialism because, because of, uh, of the, the ability of, of uh, the power of Russia is not, not at the same uh, level, but this is imperialism. Then in 2015, they intervened in uh, Syria. And uh, all these times, they took advantage of the fact that there is a certain relative, and I stress the word relative, relative decline of U.S. imperialism. U.S. imperialism at that time, 2008, was bogged down in an impossible to win war in Afghanistan and in, in Iraq. They couldn't uh, control the, the situation. Uh, now in 2000 and, uh, 2015, if you remember, Obama said, this is a red line if there's, uh, if there's what, what was it, uh, some, some chemical weapons attack. If this happens, we will intervene in Syria. But they didn't intervene in Syria uh, because the situation in, U in the U.S. is not conducive to a f another foreign military uh, intervention with ground troops. That's the thing. Because it's very easy to destroy a country for, with aerial bombardment, but once you occupy it, it's much, much more difficult to live, as it's been proven in, uh, in Afghanistan last year. So, um, taking advantage of that, Obama says there's a red line, but uh, the Russians tested the red line and nothing happened. So they went into uh, Syria and they settled the, 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 the fate of that civil uh, war. They defended, uh, they defended um, what's his name, Habet al-Assad, Assad, Assad, Assad. Assad. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and they pushed out the, the, U, the US trained uh, Islamic fundamentalists, the, the, the Arab, Saudi Arabia allies, and the, and the, and the Turkish backed cutthroat uh, Islamic reactionaries. They pushed them out of the country, they completely destroyed them. And in the process, they, 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 they destroyed the cities, the civilian population, and everything, and everything else. But from Russia's point of view, the most important thing is that they established their power. This is a region which is supposed to be strategic for U.S. imperialism. The Middle East, oil, uh, some of the main ally, main foreign allies, Saudi Arabia, Israel, and so on. And nevertheless, Russia intervened, and they won. And uh, not only they won, they made, uh, they made some allies, some, some uneasy allies like Turkey, but they made an alliance with Turkey. Now, Russia was selling, was selling what was it, anti-aircraft anti uh, weapons to Turkey, which is a NATO country. This is, uh, is unheard of, and it's a reflection of the relative weakness of U.S. imperialism. U.S. imperialism will not have tolerated this in any other period prior to this, but now they can't do anything. And so, since Russia has seen that they are probing uh, the U.S., you see what happens. Then there was this conflict in uh, Ukraine, because because the war the war has started now last week. When was it? Thursday, I think. Mm -hmm. Uh, the war started on the 24th of February, but in reality, the conflict goes back further, right? You, you could say it goes back to the, to the collapse of the Soviet Union. But, but uh, over this period, there's been a whole number of what they call color revolutions, i.e. Western-sponsored protest movements that overthrow governments in order to install governments that are, that are more Western-looking uh, and replace governments that are more Russia-looking, right? Uh, neither, uh, neither of these governments are progressive in any way, or democratic. The, the, the governments of gangsters in all of these places, in, in Georgia, in, in uh, Ukraine, and so on. And in Ukraine, there was a government, the government of, of Yanu Yanukovych, and, uh, Viktor Yanukovych. And, and I don't know if the comrades are familiar with the story at that time, but this government wasn't particularly a, a, a pro-Russian government. Mm -hmm. It was a government that was trying to balance between Russia and the European Union and so on. At one point, this government then decided that they will sign a treaty with, uh, with, uh, with the European Union. Not, not uh, membership, but, but some, some uh, joint uh, trade and so on. And they wanted uh, visas for Ukrainians. I mean, these countries are, are basically a resource of uh, a pool of cheap labor for European uh, countries. Uh, same as, as Poland and, and, and other countries. Hundreds of thousands, millions of people had to emigrate from these countries because of the collapse that capitalism has brought to these countries. Anyway, Yanukovych uh, wanted to sign this deal with the European Union. Then at the last minute, he backtracked, was probably put under pressure and so on. And then, uh, and then this, this kick-started the movement to overthrow uh, Yanukovych. This, mov this movement at the beginning had lots of people, people who wanted to fight against corruption and uh, people who had illusions in the West and they wanted to be part of Europe and democratic Europe and this and that. 
but at the end of the day the people who were carrying the day in those demonstrations the people who were, were crucial in the in the clashes and so on were far right ukrainian nationalists whose uh, who referenced themselves in the second world war nazi collaborators that uh, existed in uh, in uh, ukraine because in the, the national question in Ukraine is quite complicated, but, uh, but basically either you are on, uh, on a side that sides with Russia or on a side that sides with an imperialist power on the other side, uh, Germany, like, uh, like during the Hetmanate in, in 1918. Anyway, so, uh, so the Nazis played a key role in this. And then there was another <coughs> incident, the incident of the, of the snipers that shot at uh, people on both sides. Uh, riot police, the barefoot, and but also lots of demonstrators were killed by these snipers. And to this day, the the the, the, the investigation hasn't finished in in Ukraine. But there are very strong indications that these snipers have not been uh, called in by Yanukovych, but by his, his uh, opposition, you know, to create a situation where Yanukovych has killed a lot of innocent people and should be overthrown, and then he fled, and a new government was installed. There were quite a few governments at the beginning, uh, Avakov, Yatsenyuk, and uh, all the other people, and then they settled for, for Poroshenko. This government was a government that uh, was a bourgeois government, it wasn't a Nazi government like, like Putin says. However, this government was, was leaning on the Nazis, and the Nazis were armed, they were operating legally, and the government itself was pushing uh, a brand of uh, Ukrainian reactionary nationalism that, I mean, they, they were bringing down the statues of Lenin, putting up statues of uh, Stevan Bandera, who was, uh, who was a war criminal, uh, Ukrainian nationalist, organized an organization that uh, ma many of his supporters joined the SS Galicia division. I, they joined the Nazi uh, shock troops and carried out uh, uh, massacres of Jews and, and communists and other people. Now, this is quite a serious matter. And uh, Ukraine, as I said, the national question is very complicated. In the, in the west, you have this region, Galicia, which is uh, close to the Polish uh, border and was part of, of Poland for a long uh, time. And people there are uh, ethnic Ukrainians, they speak Ukrainian. But, but the, the more you move to the east, and finally you reach the south in uh, Odessa, Crimea, and then you reach the east, where Crimea is a different matter. But anyway, you reach the south, and then you reach the east, the Donbass, the, the, the coal mines, and so on the more people are ethnic uh, Russians, Russian speaking, mm -hmm. and, uh, and their national identity is completely different from, from this national identity referenced in the na Nazi collaborators. In fact, the national identity is based on uh, the, the Soviet fight against uh, Nazis in the Second World War, and uh, communism and all, all of that. So it's very difficult to have a, a government in, uh, in uh, Kiev that represents one side of the country, and then, and then, obviously, there was a, there was a, an uprising. People started uh, to demonstrate in many places in uh, Kharkiv, in uh, Dnipro, and a whole number of uh, towns in the cities in the east. There were big demonstrations, clashes, armed clashes, and in the far east, in the Donbas, in the Donetsk and the Luhansk uh, regions, there was an armed uprising. This armed uprising was composed of very different elements. There were, there were reactionary Russian, great Russian nationalists. There was a guy called, called um, I can't remember, well, one of the first guys who, who took arms there. He was a Russian guy who had uh, been uh, playing war games, pretending to be part of imperial uh, Russia. And uh, Girkin, that's his name, Strelkov. And, uh, and so there were far-right uh, reactionary Russian nationalists. There were other people, communists. Many people who said, we communists, we're not going to allow this uh, Stephen Bandera lovers to run the country. And there were workers. And the first, uh, the first uh, constitution of the Donetsk Republic contained some reactionary elements, but some other very progressive elements. And they, then they carried out, they said, we're going to carry out a struggle against the oligarchs. I, I, the people who, who had, uh, looted the country for all these uh, years. And some of them were nationalized, were expropriated. There were examples of workers' uh, control. But that didn't, last, that didn't last for very long. Very soon, these uh, republics came under, under fire from Kiev. Uh, this government in Kiev carried out a, a one-sided civil war against its own uh, people. Soldiers refused to fight. You should look into the details of this, because it's quite interesting. Uh, but in the end, Russia came in, gave uh, undercover military support to the to these uh, rebel republics, and uh, and it came to a stalemate. Stalemate that was based on, on a defeat of the Ukrainian army in 2014-15.
And on the basis of this, they sign the Minsk agreements. The Minsk agreements, means two agreements. They basically say that these two republics should be reincorporated into uh, Ukraine, but they should have a, a, an autonomous sta a statue. And that the rights, linguistic rights, cultural rights of the Russian-speaking population of, uh, of uh, Ukraine should be respected. This is basically what it says. But in reality, what it says is that uh, Russia will have a say in, in what happens in Ukraine for, for the foreseeable future. That's the aim of uh, Minsk II. And that's the reason why Putin was never in favor of the independence of the two republics, which the people voted for. Uh, he said, no, no, uh, because independence meant what? That the, the Putin will have to bankroll these, uh, these uh, republics, and uh, it will be very costly. And he, he had no, nothing to gain from, from that. He wanted control of, uh, or, or at least uh, leverage, in uh, Ukraine. Um, and in the process also, he then invaded uh, Crimea, carried out the referendum. How can you carry out the referendum and, and the armed uh, invasion? But probably, I mean, if you, if you think about it, the, the overwhelming majority of population in Crimea uh, would have voted in a free referendum uh, to join uh, Russia. Did they want anything to do with this government in, in Kiev? And I don't, and I don't blame them. Uh, but, but this is not the reason why uh, Russia intervened. The reason why Russia intervened is because um, Sevastopol is the seat, the, the headquarters of the of the bolt of the of the of the fleet of the um, of the Russian uh, fleet in the in the in the region, and so they couldn't uh, they couldn't allow that to go. Uh, strategic important uh, point, and also they knew they had the, the support of the population, so, they, so that's why they annexed uh, Crimea in 2000. Was it 14 or 15 or 14? Um, and that's the origin of this uh, of this conflict. This conflict doesn't come from now. And then, and then you had several governments. Poroshenko came to power on on a platform of making peace with Russia, and settling. But but then he, he changed. And this other president they have now, Zelensky, is uh, is uh, is uh, I don't know, is a, is a comedian. He used to be in a TV show in which a comedian becomes the president of the country. <laughs> and then true. And then he became the president of the country. And uh, as always, he presented himself as, as an outsider, nothing to do with politics, and, uh, and we're going to bring peace with uh, Russia, and we're going to deal with the oligarchs. But in fact, he was being bankrolled by Kolomoisky, one of the main uh, oligarchs in, uh, in uh, Ukraine. The minute he entered into uh, office, he, ca he changed his, poli his policies. He leaned on the far-right uh, militias, because otherwise the far-right militias will have uh, maybe removed him from, from power by force. Um, he made deals with the oligarchs and then pursued an anti-Russian policy, a uh, policy to downgrade the status of the Russian language in uh, public media, in uh, cinemas, uh, everywhere. Uh, the banning of uh, opposition newspapers, which most of them were in the Russian uh, language, and so, uh, I mean, this is even Biden said in November, uh, you can't have uh, you can't have uh, Ukraine joining NATO because its democratic uh, credentials are not up to scratch. Uh, it's quite <coughs> true. Um, so anyway, this is also a country where the Communist Party has been illegalized. Uh, communist organizations have been driven underground by the fascists and by the state. And the fascists and the states have basically fused. This Azov Battalion, the main force of the of the neo Nazis, is now part of the Ukrainian uh, National Guard and has been trained by the UK government uh, with military aid and by the US uh, government. Complete uh, scandal. But then they talk about the sovereignty of Ukraine. What sovereignty of Ukraine are they talking about? This, this is a country that's run by the IMF and, uh, and, uh, and the US embassy. Uh, this is not, not a sovereign uh, country at all. So basically, this is what led to this point. And, and they were pushing this question of NATO membership all the time. In 2019, I think it was, or 2020, they put it in the Constitution that uh, Ukraine's aim is to join the North Atlantic Treaty and Pact, and as a European country, they will be one day a member of the you know, European Union. This is a red rag to a bull for uh, Putin. Why? Because he cannot ac uh, accept any more uh, encro encroachment, as he sees it, of, of uh, Western imperialism into his area of influence. There is another reason why Putin's carried out this uh, war, and the other reason is popularity. Uh, the popularity of Putin's been going down 
recently because of what? Because of attacks on workers' rights, attacks on pensions, attacks on democratic rights, the collapse of living standards, and so on. And uh, so he calculates that by uh, by having a, a by by, be, by be presenting himself as a strong man that defends the Russian people uh, home and abroad and blah blah blah, he will whip up uh, nationalist uh, fervor and his popularity will go up again, as it did in 2014. So he worked at that time. He thinks he will work at this time. Whether he will work or not is a different uh, matter. Uh, but but that's, that's a separate question. This is one of his motivations. But the other motivation is this plain, naked imperialism. He wants to control Ukraine, or he wants at least to, to ensure that there is a neutral government in, uh, in Ukraine. This government in Ukraine can do whatever they want as long as they uh, don't, don't step over the line of, of what Russia wants. Uh, pretty much the same aim that the United States had when invaded Iraq. Uh, Saddam Hussein was not, not particularly uh, anti-imperialist or progressive or anything like this. He's been an ally of uh, Western imperialism for many years. They uh, funded him, they armed him, they gave him uh, chemical weapons, which he used against the Kurds in, uh, in Halabja. And then at one point, he stopped, the, he didn't follow orders, and then uh, they went in to remove him. That's exactly the same uh, behavior. So what is our position in this, in this war? First of all, we're not in favor of Putin's invasion, Russia's invasion of Ukraine. It's a wholly reactionary, uh, it's a wholly imperialist uh, adventure, which can only have reactionary effects. It will have the effect of pushing many in Ukraine towards reactionary Ukrainian uh, nationalism. It will have the effect of pushing the others towards uh, greater uh, Russian chauvinism in, in, the, in, the, in the East. And the division of the working class in Ukraine along national, ethnic, and language lines will, will, will further widen. <laughs> and there, there's nothing progressive about that. In fact, the, 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 the Russian and Ukrainian people uh, have, have strong bonds for many years. Uh, the workers' movement was a united workers' uh, movement. But this was also, uh, this could only be carried out because of the very careful policy that Lenin followed in relation to the national question. Of uh, when, when, when uh, the Soviet Union was created in 1922, 100 years now, uh, this year. And uh, the way it was created was a, a union of equals between the Transcaucasian uh, Soviet Federation, which included uh, Armenia, Azerbaijan, and Georgia, I think, and uh, Russia, the Russian uh, Soviet uh, Republic, and the Ukrainian Soviet Republic, which was an independent country that uh, created a confederation with the, with the others. And, uh, and it's in the Constitution. It says any time country that wants to leave this uh, union, they can leave so voluntarily in a democratic uh, way. That's why, that's why Putin said in his speech, when he uh, trying to justify this, he said, he said, he said, Lenin and the Bolsheviks created uh, an independent Ukraine, uh, which is not exactly true. The Ukrainian national identity went uh, back further. But it's true. That's the only time that, Ukraine, uh, that Ukraine was an independent country in, in its, more or less, its current uh, borders. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and he said, now you, do, you want decommunification, communization, or whatever, whatever the word is, because they have laws in, uh, in uh, Kiev, in, in Ukraine. They have a, a, an anti-communist law. Being a communist is illegal. Uh, having communists, waving a communist symbol is illegal. People get arrested all the time for, for, for this. So you want decommunization. Well, we'll, we'll, uh, we'll go back to what you had before, uh, before Lenin created uh, Ukraine. And what was there? the Russian Empire, the, the, the jailhouse of the nations, as Lenin, uh, Lenin said. There's nothing progressive in this, in, in Putin's uh, motivations, and uh, we'll only have negative effects. However, we, we're not in Russia. We are here in London, and uh, our main task here in London is not so much to denounce uh, Putin. Uh, that's, that, that's the job of the workers in, uh, and, and the youth and the communists in Russia. And they doing though, and they doing so. The members of the IMT in uh, in Russia are fighting against this war. Many of them have been arrested in these demonstrations <coughs> in the last in the last few days. But our main duty here is to denounce Western imperialism, which is largely responsible for this. And that in any case, if you were to compare Russian imperialism and U.S. imperialism, which which is the most reactionary force, the most powerful imperialist force on the planet, is, is U.S. imperialism. And, and they are largely responsible for this conflict up until 
right now, a few weeks ago. I mean, this could have been solved uh, relatively easily. Uh, Putin uh, was, try was trying to get a deal. He, di he didn't necessarily wanted an invasion, which is going to be costly and complicated and so on. He would have been happy with a deal, a deal on his terms, of course. But uh, these terms were not so onerous for the West. Biden had already said the question of NATO membership for Ukraine is not on the agenda in the short term. And uh, he'd already said this. However, there's a small problem. If the big bully in the schoolyard is seen as making concessions to the smaller bully that comes along and uh, starts threatening him, then he loses all, uh, all his authority. And then who's to say that the other bullies will come and, uh, and push him out? Uh, so this is the reason why, uh, why uh, the West and, and the US couldn't give any concessions. And therefore, war was inevitable. Why? Because the West had already said, this is another interesting point, they said, we're not going to send troops. You remember, what's his name? Uh, Boozy Johnson. Uh, the party gate uh, man that rules this country. <laughs> he went on a, on a tour of, a whistle stop tour of uh, Eastern uh, Europe and he then promised we're going to send troops. Where are, gonna, where are they going to send troops? To Ukraine, which is uh, the threat of imminent invasion. No, they're going to send troops to Poland, which is not uh, threatened by anyone at this particular time. And then they get the, the US is now sending troops, 8,000 troops they're going to send to where? To Germany, <laughs> which is not, not part of the theater of uh, operation, as far as possible. What did the U.S. say to Zelensky the minute the war started? They said, you should, you should move out of Kiev. You should move to Lviv in the west of the country. That will have meant the collapse of, uh, of the whole uh, thing. And uh, they actually moved the embassy. The U.S. moved the embassy from Kiev to Lviv in the west. And now they moved the embassy to Poland. I mean, we, we prepare to defend uh, our ally until the last drop of someone else's blood, mm -hmm. as, as Alan says in his, uh, in his article. It's completely despicable, the, the role of Western imperialism. And in any case, they are responsible for this uh, war. Uh, Russia is partly responsible, obviously. This is the, the aggressor in this, in this uh, case. But you see in international uh, politics and in war, there is not just one aggressor. You go, you go a, few, a few steps back and there is someone else who, who took the first, uh, the first uh, shot, you know. So anyway, this is our position. Our position in the West must be first and foremost to denounce the hypocrisy of the, the West, the warmongering of, the, of, our, of, our own, uh, of our own leaders and disassociate ourselves with any idea that we're going to get involved in this uh, war. And this is unfortunately, I have to say, not the position that many on the left in this country have taken. Uh, there were some Labour MPs that si signed the Stop the War Coalition statement. Stop the War Coalition statement had the merit that they criticized NATO, although, although the Stop the War Coalition, I have to say, was a very weak statement that talked about international law and diplomacy and instead of talking about uh, imperialism, you can't fight imperialism with international, inter who's going to enforce international law? In fact, the only, the only way to stop imperialist war is socialist revolution, to bring down the capitalist system that creates these wars. Anyway, so they signed this statement. And then Kia Starmer said, uh, egged on by, by the Tory uh, MPs, you, you must withdraw your signature from this statement or be expelled from the parliamentary Labour Party. And what did they do? This is, this, is, this is a scandal that they were asked to do this. But it's shameful that then they, they all rushed within an hour to withdraw their, their signatures from this uh, statement. People were, were lining up to defend them at GC meetings across the country, writing emergency resolutions to defend them. And by the time these meetings took place, they had already caved in, uh, which is completely scandalous. But there is worse, obviously, the position of Keir Starmer which is now more warmongering than, uh, than Boris Johnson, uh, on all fronts except one, on the question of refugees. Will they open the door for, for Ukrainian refugees? The government says no. And, uh, and, uh, and the opposition says no. The, the Labour MPs have voted against an amendment that will have opened the doors for, for people fleeing this, uh, this uh, dreadful uh, uh, war. And then worse than this, there are some that are not in the leadership of the Labour Party, some on the left in this country, have also sided with US uh, and, and British uh, imperialism on the basis of hands of Ukraine. The main enemy is, uh, is Russia. They're basically uh, lining up 
with uh, reactionary uh, Ukrainian nationalism and, and Western uh, imperialism, which is completely standard and it's led them down, down a very dangerous uh, path, I would say. So just to finish with this, uh, as I said, our position is clear. We oppose this war. Uh, it's an imperialist war, and we oppose it. It's quite clear. There's nothing progressive going to come out of this uh, war for the workers of Ukraine, for the workers of uh, Russia. And our comrades in Russia have taken a, a made a clear stand on this uh, question. Our main duty is, however, here to denounce the hypocrisy of Western uh, imperialism and, and, the, and the platitudes. And uh, at the end of the day, we need to also understand war and imperialist wars like this, w there will be more. In the, in the future. This war will have an impact on the economy, which is already very fragile. And who's going to be asked to pay for all of this? The working class, through cuts, layoffs, uh, destruction of uh, rights and standards, and, and so on. We're going to be asked to pay for the wars of the rich. And uh, the rich are becoming richer with this uh, war. Germany has announced uh, a plan to spend, uh, I don't know how many millions in, in weapons, and uh, the stocks of uh, arms manufacturers have gone up in the stock exchange uh, everywhere. They are profiting from this war. The ordinary working people lose uh, out. And therefore, in the final analysis, if we want to be effectively fighting against imperialist uh, war, we need to put an end to the capitalist uh, system. The workers need to come to power and put an end to this rotten system that can only bring crisis, war, hunger, poverty, and, uh, and war and, and destruction.